From the Library of Maria Menounos, this is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. Hey guys, welcome back to Book Circle Online. I'm your host, Jeffrey Masters, and I'm here today with Stephen T. Siegel. Stephen's a member of the Man of Action writing team and a creator of Big Hero 6. His new graphic novel is called Imperial. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Of course, yeah. I enjoyed the graphic novel. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I want to get to Imperial, but while we're speaking about Big Hero 6, uh, that must have been pretty incredible to see it win the Academy Award. Oh, it was uh, amazing. You know, those are... A team and characters that I made up with the artist Duncan Rulo, who's another one of our partners in Man of Action, uh, for a Marvel comic called Alpha Flight back in the 90s. Yeah. And Duncan and I literally sat in his uh, office, which is a little shack behind his house, uh, just working on a thought, how do we have fun this month? What do we do? And I just said, why don't we make up a team of crazy superheroes from Japan? Marvel will probably say we can't do it. And, you know, uh, they didn't. And we did it. And we thought, well, that's that. You'll never see them again. They were fun. We loved them. So it was Oscar. not its own. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't its own comic even. It was just part of one. We worked on a comic book called Alpha Flight, oh. which was the Canadian version of the X-Men. Okay. And <laughs> in the X-Men, back in the day when I was a, a young, avid fan, uh, one issue, what, like number 120 or something, suddenly the, the Canadian X-Men showed up and tried to get Wolverine back. Oh. And so I just thought, wouldn't it be funny if instead of like a kick-ass Canadian team, it was kind of a pop culture-influenced Japanese team who doesn't come to steal somebody back, but somebody goes back to them and they're like, we've moved on. Yeah. So we just inverted it and, you know, made up a whole new crew and that totally. was Big Hero 6. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering, like, how f that was in 1998. How did Disney come to pick it as their first, like, Marvel adaptation? I think a, a couple of things were in its favor. Not and, to be, like, pejorative. No, no, no. <laughs> well, listen, it, they weren't the okay. most well-known team, yeah. uh, to be sure, and now they're slightly higher profile. Uh one thing had to do with Marvel's properties all being taken. So a lot of the well-known characters were spoken for, okay. had movie deals, were tied up in other contracts. A lot of like the, the X-Men characters are still controlled by the people who control the X-Men license. So Big Hero 6 was one of those teams that was outside of everything. It was its own beast. Yeah. And it was available. And because there hadn't been that much done with it, they were forgotten. So nobody had thought of them. Uh, so that was in its favor. But... More importantly, I think, was the, the kind of dynamics of that team. In our version, Hero, who's kind of the, the young teenage protagonist, builds a robot to take the place of his dead father. And so it was always about this kind of idea of technology taking the place of your family and can you move on with a placeholder in, instead of the actual person. Yeah. In the movie, it's his brother instead. But that had a certain emotional weight to it that a lot of characters, when you look at, don't. And I know for John Lasseter, who runs both Pixar and Disney, that was really central to him was that idea of loss of family and can you move on and can a surrogate take the place of the real thing and so those themes really worked for them that's very current too with the robots like oh, having yeah, it's that getting role. more current soon there won't be us there'll be two robots talking about books <laughs> yeah a lot easier for written me. by robots <laughs> which won't have typos yeah is is the comic and like graphic novel industry changing since like the last like the 10 most successful movies ever half of them are comic book movies is that like influencing the comic industry at all? It, it is, but I'm going to dodge your question a little bit and just say that this is not even a question we have for novels where we go, here's a sci-fi novel and a children's novel and a YA novel and a historical oh. novel. We don't have this question with films. We say, here's an animated film. Here's a live action film. Here's a period piece. Here's a black and white. Yeah. Like we understand that mediums can support different types of stories and can always evolve. Yeah. So comics can do that too. Comics is just another way to deliver a story and you can do any kind of story you want. So yes is the answer. Yeah. But it's unfortunate because comics can do more than just replicate what people are liking right now. And they always have really. Yeah. I guess I'm just curious since like, like I mean, print media is like, you know, phasing out. Um, I just wondered like how that was like influencing. Well, it. I will say that digital comics, uh, Eight years ago, people were like, oh, it's the death of print. There won't be printed comics anymore, yeah. and here comes the end. But just like vinyl records, there are people who want to hold that object in their hands. Yeah. And there are people who want a million different things on an iPad while they're on a train. And it turns out that for comics, at least, those are different audiences. The people who would like an iPad full of comics on the train really weren't buying print comics because they're on a train. 
And so it kind of opened doors to new new readers. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, and we didn't lose the print readers, actually. Okay, well, I mean, I myself don't read anything on, like, a Kindle or a reader yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm old school, too. I like a big stack of yeah. crazy books to fall on me in an earthquake. Yeah, exactly. I guess that's a different discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Imperial, this is a reissue. Right? It is. Uh, but in the world of new comics, it's a reissue that comes out like five minutes after the... Right. You know. Did you initially imagine as like a graphic novel altogether? Yeah, I don't do uh, what what is somewhat derogatorily called a floppy these days in yeah. comics. Uh, single issues. Not my thing much anymore. I, I tend to think in complete thoughts and I don't do uh, ongoing anything. So okay. I, when I thought of Imperial, I really thought of the ending right away. I was like, here's what I have to say about this. Yeah. Uh, and I structured it as a book. Uh, but Image Comics is doing very well with standalone issues. And the publisher, Eric Stevenson, just said, is there any way to break it up? And it was tough, actually. I had to do a very weird comic format, which is front cover, 30 solid pages of comic back cover with the credits on the back cover. Yeah. Uh, it was the only way I could think to break it up. So I, I did intend it as just a standalone single volume. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. It, it was funny. I, I, my new favorite comeback is um, I, I've seen the rings in Saturn with my own eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use that for years. It's the debate between s'mores and the rings of Saturn and which one is more more ass kicking than the other, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean that reminded me like of like Elon Musk. Mm. You know, like he's like he's literally changing the world. Yeah. He's working on SpaceX, which mission is to make space travel less expensive yep. to colonize Mars. And he his like marriages are failing. Um electric cars. Yeah, but he's literally changing the world. Yeah. Like that's Mark's debate. Oh yeah. Which is interesting. Very, very amazing. He's yeah. A, he's an incredible guy. I I did want to play a little bit with that, but but as you know from having read Imperial, I favor the non Elon Musks of the world. Right. Uh, the people who are just trying to make small personal connections. So it, it is it's a book about, you know, is is real power the ability to connect with a person or is real power the ability to smash a boulder with, you know, laser beam eyes. Yeah. And it seems like in that debate though it's only one or the other. Like, you can never have both. You can have both. Uh, I don't love superhero comics. I'll just I'll out oh, myself really? right here. I don't. I've never been good at them. I wrote a book called It's a Bird, which is about how much I don't like Superman. Right. Uh, and then after that, I wrote the Superman comic book, and I really should have just read my own book about how much I don't like Superman and taken my advice and not done it, uh, probably. But uh, I, I feel like as a kid who was skinny and kind of not tremendously picked on, but not, I, I wasn't going to get in any playground fights and win for sure that the superhero for me was always this unattainable goal and I, it really alienated me I didn't even like comic books actually as a kid my best oh, really? friend loved them and I started reading them because I had to walk with him to Safeway every week while he bought Spider-Man and I'd be like ah oh, it's so boring and so I just started buying the other comics he didn't buy and reading yeah them. but I really I, I liked the outsiders I didn't like the heroes I didn't like the muscles I liked the weirdos uh, and so some of my superhero work now I'm just working out my childhood issues of of that I like people more than I like crazy superheroes. Oh interesting. Well that's interesting because like of the Imperial, he has like the most like standard like superhero powers. Mm -hmm. You know, like strength and just flight. Just a super superman in quotes amalgam yeah. kind of stand in. How did you come to give him like that the crown is like the source of his power? Well the the Hitch of that book is that Mark, who's the kind of every man, is getting married in mm -hmm. about 10 days. At the same point, he's picked by Imperial to become the next Imperial. Uh, and so it becomes a conflict for him as to, do I go to my rehearsal dinner? Do I learn how to fly? You know, what, what's on the docket? So I wanted the kind of binding uh, metaphor for both of those things to be a ring. And I hadn't seen a superhero who had a, you know, a ring of power that's a crown. Oh, interesting. So the wedding ring, the crown, where, you know, whose gold circle do you take? Oh, I didn't pick up on that. That's all right. <laughs> Not everything needs to be picked <laughs> up on, I guess. Oh, that's really interesting, though. Um, was, and speaking of in like specifics, I thought that the um, narrations like work so well. Oh, and, thanks. Yeah, of course. Especially since like there's like an inherent precision in like comic timing in like mm. this form. Um, how did you decide to have it as like narrated, though? Well, uh, I work, I have a theater company also, and I have a right. comedy that's toured for like 10 years, and I love nothing more than uh, most of my work I do, and it goes out, and I don't see people consume it. And so it's been really interesting to go. I've seen almost every performance of the play, which is a, a comedy, and I love, I love that I know the laughs. I know exactly how an audience is going to shape yeah. a laugh and the timing of it, whatever. 
And I thought, I, well, I haven't tried that in comics. I haven't tried to do anything even remotely funny. I'm, I'm a fairly funny guy, but I'm, my stuff is always very... Uh, because uh, I like a downer. I think I have a good life, and so my creative life is a downer. Sure. That's, that's the offset. So I <laughs> Better to, than both downers. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I wanted to try to write something that was somewhat funny, and I just loved the idea that Imperial would have this perfect elocution and amazing vocabulary and excellent speech patterns. And then the narrator would be like, I think I peed myself. You know, it's just kind of a, just a down, schlubby kind of guy. Yeah. And so I picked narrative captions in the comics are usually inside the head of the hero, and it's usually stuff I can't relate to about how wonderful they are and strong and amazing. So I, I just thought it'd be fun to flip that over and have the narrative be the guy who can barely order lunch. Oh, <laughs> and usually I guess they're like, they're sophisticated, the narrations. Well, they're, they're certainly high-minded, <laughs> if nothing yeah. else. You know, they're not, they're not thinking about, you know, the idea that you just, uh, Mark is slinging his dad's ashes in the Rocky Mountains at the opening and he unfortunately slings them on Imperial. Uh, yeah, and assumes that Imperial is going to destroy him as a result of it, so he pisses himself, and you know, just a right. lot of a lot of thoughts about that, the weighty stuff of the world. Yeah, but the book is about that. I mean, the book is about is is the minutia of life the win, or is the grand scheme, the Elon Musk pattern, the win? Yeah, and I think a lot of people don't respect their own presence in the world enough to go, you know, uh, I, I love electricians. Like everybody's like, you have to go to college and get a degree and become a, and I'm like. I wish more people would be an electrician, which you still have to learn a lot for, but you don't have to go to college. And I can't do the stuff electricians do. I'm amazed by watching somebody run cables and know which ones to connect and not shock themselves to death. Yeah. You know, and I, I think that we've lost, in some ways, connection with the, the kind of decency of things people do that are just perceived as, that's oh, run of the mill, that's every day. And that, I think Imperial is me ranting about that a little bit interesting run of the mill because they perchance don't require like a higher education are you saying in one regard i mean it's still i think it does require edu higher education it doesn't require college just like you training know, it, yeah it requires training but uh and so in mark's world there's a lot of stuff he does that's special like his relationship and his ability to you know relate to his girlfriend even though he's kind of uh, you know not the brightest bulb in the block he's right for her but he sold this bill of goods that you need to be more, you need to be heroic, you need to have a costume, you need to, you know, do these things that are above human status. And I don't know if I accept that. Okay. Wait, where did the, not when did like the idea come from, but when did you have the idea and then you finally said, I have to like make this my next project? Uh, I, at this point, like I said, work in kind of complete thoughts. And so I was working on uh, a couple of other projects that were very abstract. I like, I like abstraction uh, in a lot of my work. And this idea just kind of popped into my head in looking at the artist Mark Dos Santos's portfolio. And he was somebody I knew I wanted to work with at some point. And I'd actually pitched him a different thing that was uh, uh, about kind of uh, a strange, uh, I can't even explain, it's abstract to the point that I can't describe my own process. <laughs> uh, but kind of about communication and how communication can be corrupted. It was very high-minded, and I didn't actually do that project yet, and I probably will. But I looked at his work, uh, and I was just like, we need to do this thing about a guy getting married and becoming a hero at the same time, which was just something I had in my notebooks as something I wanted to do. It wasn't in my mind at the moment. Just looking at his art, I thought, that's the story for this art. Uh, and I like to do two things with artists. I like to give them something that suits them, and then I like to push them. So if I work with somebody more than once, you know, I'm definitely in the push mode. Yeah. But the first time I go, here's the purest example of what I think your art should do. And I like Mark on a superhero book, uh, but I don't like superhero books. So, Imperial. Okay. <laughs> and yet you're in this industry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm barely in this industry. Uh, you know do you what really I, think that? Uh, the, the few fans that I have like when I'm doing weird shit. Yeah. Uh, and my superhero books... I've tried my best, uh, and they're not very good. You know, they're fine, but they're not. I read other people's superhero books, and I'm like, this person knows what they're doing. Okay. You know, I read Frank Miller's Daredevil or Brian Bendis's Daredevil, and I go, these guys know Daredevil. I think if I wrote Daredevil, we'd be like, we're not so sure you know Daredevil. Well, I think that's also like the difficulty in like making Daredevil like recognizable as Daredevil, but also like new because mm -hmm. you don't want to see him fight the same character. Yeah, there is definitely. An oldness to it. My Superman book, the, the It's a Bird book, what yeah. I did right there was that I was I was very into kind of metafiction and I was into autobiography and I made a metafiction autobiography Superman story Yeah. Uh, that was about 
it was 20 short stories about what makes Superman super, in quotes, uh, a lot of which I don't agree with. And so I, I was able to put that viewpoint in, and that was new. It's a book that I hadn't read before, and that's why it was good. Yeah. And I think with a lot of my superhero stuff, I go, oh, I really liked Claremont and Burns X-Men. I'll do my best to replicate that, and it doesn't work. You know, I think Bendis' Daredevil said something new about Daredevil from mm -hmm. a Bendis point of view. And so you still read superhero work, though? Uh, some. Okay. I, I have to keep up with things. I mean, we in Man of Action do a lot of cartoons. We worked on Spider-Man and Avengers for Marvel. So at that point, I will go and say, well, what's happening in Spider-Man and the Avengers? Because I have a duty as a professional to keep up. Yeah. Uh, and I watched the films we were talking about just before we started. You know, I, I, I keep my finger in it. And if somebody says, hey, you've really got to read... You know, the, the Luna brothers are doing great stuff with superheroes and, and Ultra. I'll go read Ultra and see what they're up to. But it's not my go-to. Okay. What is your... I, I guess a lot of people, like, they grow up and they want to write superhero, uh, Superman. They want to write yeah. Batman. Do you have any, like, any, like, wants like that? I was like, in the industry? Well, the nice thing is that Man of Action publishes through Image primarily yeah. now. And our deal with uh, Image, not a deal, but Eric Stevenson just said, I'll publish what you want to do. Wow. Well, what I want to do is go watch, you know, Einstein on the beach and then say, okay, what's the four hour Philip Glass, Robert Wilson version of a comic book? And I'll do that. That, that excites me. Like trying gotcha. to bring something totally new to our form excites me, but that's not very commercial generally. And so if I take that to Marvel or DC, by and large, they're going to say uh, no. Well, not commercial, but it's nice that you're under like the man of action group, which is doing a lot of commercial stuff. Oh yeah. You can do both. You can do both. And I think Imperial is more commercial than I usually am. But a book where, you know, a hero is trying to recruit a human and a human instead recruits a hero, that's, that's I wouldn't get away with that at Marvel either. So yeah. I love that at Image I can do what I'm thinking of. Um, yeah. Um, speaking of Mark, uh, in the back you mentioned that you nixed inset panels and went almost primarily horizontal format. Mm -hmm. um, why did you guys make that decision? Uh there was something just nice about the simplicity of that that book. I, again, I don't think that's a superhero book for a superhero savvy reader. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm always trying to find new people to read my stuff. And a lot of people who do read my stuff were not expecting that a superhero book would show up for me. And so I wanted to make sure that people like my mom, who's like, which which way do I go on this page? And I just wanted to just straight down, mom, just keep going down. Okay. Uh, just to, for simplicity's sake. Uh, more than anything. And also just the, he had done a couple of pages that were more horizontally oriented and they just looked better. Oh. Yeah. Is there ever a time that like what he's done on the page is like more interesting than, but you have to like, your text will take up space so that he has to change what he's done or you have to change what you've done to like allow for that? Yeah, be the best comics are exactly that. I mean, there's a synthesis of a process for writers and artists. And I, one of the worst things about working at the big companies was I would have to work with people that I didn't know or couldn't talk to or didn't know they were drawing that particular issue because it was changed suddenly. And I'm very much about, I want to know who I'm working with. I want to have conversations about the process, not endlessly, but I want us to, to gel. I want to give them what they want. Yeah. So I work with a Danish artist a lot, Teddy Christensen. He wants me to write every single thing in my head for him. And then he wants to be able to move away from that if he has a better idea. I love that. I worked with a guy named Guy Davis for a long time on Sam and Mystery Theater for DC. He wants the opposite. He just, just tell me what's happening, I'll draw it, and then I would go back and write the dialogue after he had already drawn it because he's a consummate storyteller and he just he wants to get the world right. So uh, I've become right now very obsessed with, well, what else can we do? So I did a book with uh, the Danish guy called The Red Diary, which was yeah. a book that he had done in Europe uh, that was, uh, I didn't know what it was about. I just had it in French and Danish and I kept flipping through it and going, this looks really cool. And he said, well, why don't you put it out in the U S and I said, well, I, I'd, I'd have to do something on it because I can't put out your stuff in the U S through image. And he was like, well, translate it. And I said, well, that's great, but I speak English and nothing else. Yeah. Uh, so it sat for two years and then I, the more I looked at it, I thought, I think I could translate this just cause I, I get it. I know what this is about. And so I just looked at it, wrote a script kept all the word balloons in the same place in the same length. If I saw the word Paris, I use the word Paris, you know, and I tried to get it. I just tried to crack the code of what this sequence of images was telling me. Based on the images. Just on the images. That's fascinating. Uh, and sent him the script and it was totally wrong, needless to say. Yeah. Uh, and so he sent me a, a translation of his script and it was, I was like, well, now you have the same set of images and two completely different books. 
So we published it as a flip book with both versions. Uh, and in his, it's about a guy who's trying to track the provenance of a Cezanne painting. And mine is about a guy in World War I who steals somebody else's identity in a foxhole to try to reset his life. Uh, and it's, it is the same images, but it tells both of those stories. That's and fascinating. So, well, and now I'm obsessed with like, what do we do next? So the same guy and I are doing a book currently called Mercury. Uh, and I'm say currently because we don't know what the book is about. We're finishing the book and then we'll know what it's about. Uh, and Teddy is drawing 240 images that are all the same size and orientation uh, and then sending them to me in a random order. So he has a story in mind. He's drawing that story. I'm getting it out of sequence. Wow. My job is to sequence it and write a script and then that's the book. So whatever he had in mind is not the book. I don't even know what he has in mind. Oh, or what you the book can is. change panels the way you need it well, I, for your story. I won't even know what the order is supposed to be. Oh, because it'll be like a deck of cards. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's already been shuffled. And so I'm going to lay it out and figure out what came first and what came last, who they are, what's happening. Like the images I've seen, there's a submarine and there's like a guy in a suit and there's an explosion and a skull. I don't even, I couldn't begin to process it. But we're just going to see, you know, can a book emerge from a shuffled deck of images? That's really neat. And then that'll be it. Like I, I don't ever want to know what he had in mind. Have you started that yet? I've seen he because obviously because it's out of order, I don't want pet panels as he finishes them so he sends me like blocks of 60 so i've seen you know 60 to 100 wow yeah and, and that's gonna be Mer mercury well right now it's called mercury because until the script is finished i don't even know what the book's about i just know it's mercurial the process yeah. is mercurial has anybody created a work like that before in the industry i hope not <laughs> <laughs> that's what i'm trying to get at I'm, okay fingers crossed <laughs> yeah and i'm doing uh -huh. another uh so i did a mini comic last year called the bus which is part of a bigger work uh, that i'm doing with a guy named jason katzenstein uh which is kind of a ya uh summer camp teen thing uh, but our next project together is going to be completely driven by chance operation kind of the John Cage of it all. Okay. So we have a, I can't tell you the device uh, because it's the name of the book and we're not announcing that, but we have this device. Like if you were rolling a die and you were like, uh, how many pages are, you, are is uh, Superman going to be in? And you roll in six. Okay, six pages of Superman. Uh, then Batman shows up for one page. You know, and so mm -hmm. not only like page count, but the characters, the storylines, the life and death of the characters, everything about this project will be determined by random chance. Wow. Off of a schema that we came up with. Wow. It's like choose your own adventure just by chance, though. Yeah, I'm letting the like, universe choose my own adventure. But yeah. then the trick is, like, it's it's not random random. Like, we still have to execute a story that an audience yeah. leaves and goes, I got something out of that. Wow. It's just that the, the kind of constraints of it that I would normally go, oh, I think that'll be four pages. I'm leaving up to the universe. Interesting. So one of the things I read about you is that you said in another interview that like the key to your creativity is being surprised. Mm. So I didn't know what that meant, but I guess now talking to you, this is like very... I think the first 20 years that much. I wrote was me going, I've got to really be in control to make this thing happen. And mm -hmm. I have a good enough toolbox now. And I, I'm trying to dispatch control and just say, bring me whatever. I, I got the tools. I'll make this happen. Wow. It's and you know in animation, TV, and film where man of action works a lot, it's the opposite. So it's a good yin yang for trying to stay creative and yeah moving forward. You work in a lot of um, like fields and aspects mm -hmm. of the entertainment industry. The the play you were talking about earlier was mm -hmm. that NWC. It is NWC. Um, I saw that actually. You did in two thousand seven. Where in the world did you see it? Uh, North Carolina. What? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, when I was like researching Raleigh, Durham. It, uh, yeah. Yeah. I was like, what? No way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I vaguely, that was that, it was like in a big downtown kind of theater. Yeah, like a massive theater full. I remember that, yeah. Yeah. I um, was there. I was there for all Oh, time. really? Oh, yeah. how funny. Oh, really? Yeah. Did you travel with the I show? Did. I still do. We just did a show in Pennsylvania last week. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, I remember just being like, this is like really interesting and insightful and personal um, and yet really entertaining. Yeah, I'm, I'm a populist guy, so I, as much as I crawl up my own ass to do creative things, I still worry uh, what, what will people think when they leave. I don't want somebody to pay for something and go, that was a waste of time, yeah. a waste of money. And obviously that can still happen. I mean, you're not going to appease everyone. But especially with theater, I've been to so much theater where I, I leave and I'm like, oh, can I have that 90 minutes back? You know, and I like, I'm 
I am the poster child for avant-garde. You can, I'll sit and watch somebody, you know, yeah. break a saw in half for an hour and be like, that was amazing. So it takes a lot to just bore me to death. But theater often is just really boring. And so with NWC, you know, it, I wanted a show that comes off uh, like stand-up comedy and sketch comedy, but it's actually a play. If you see it twice, whatever you think is, oh, they're making that up, none of it's made up. It's meticulous. But mm -hmm. the guys who are in it are great at making it seem like this is the first time we've said this. Yeah. It, it's it's still going, like touring. Mm -hmm. How long has that been? Like 10 years? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really We keep impressive. hoping they'll, you know, I mean, it's the N and the W and the C are three slangs for uh, ethnic slurs that you could probably figure out pretty yeah. easily, especially the N. Uh, and we just keep hoping there's no need for it. And sadly, then fraternities get on a bus and sing a song, <laughs> or, you know, there are shootings in towns that are race related. And, it's, you know, we the whole end of that show, when you saw it, probably, you know, maybe, I mean, was about that we'll never have a black president. And then we got a black president. We're like, okay, we're done with NWC. Well, no, because racism yeah. turns and gets even more evasive and subtle and under, but it's still there. Mm -hmm. And communities keep calling us and going, could you come do? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Did you create that as well? Uh so all three of the guys who are the original performers and co-writers uh, with my wife and I were my wife's students at community college. Wow. Uh, and then they all transferred to UCLA. They were theater majors, two of them. And uh, Rafa, who plays the W, wanted to write a one-man show and just knew I was a writer and asked if I would help him. And I said, nothing sounds worse than a one-man show. So could we do a three-man one-man show with that's these the guys? That's the best note he could funny? have got, honestly. <laughs> well, and it's, you know, it's panned out. So that's a, it's a career for him. So It's still him. Oh yeah, he's he's still in it. The other two guys, uh, one quit to get his master's yeah. degree, and he's teaching, uh, but comes back sometimes for shows. Uh, and the other guy quit to tour with his band, who he could never tour with. Because I mean, honestly, we did that show and thought, you know, two shows at UCLA were done, and then it got signed for downtown LA, and we're like, okay, six weeks were done. It got extended, and then it got signed for a national tour, and it just we kept thinking a year, two years, three years. It just never stopped. So it's like you said, like. Yay, it's still running, but like, darn it, it's still necessary. But but good. I mean, because art at its best uh, is that rhetorical conversation with an audience, you know, book, play, whatever. And so if there's a need for that conversation, I'm glad that NWC, which is at least funny and entertaining. Yes. And starts that conversation. I mean, if we do performing arts centers, we'll do a week of residency also and go out into the community and, you know, talk about these issues. And those guys are very well versed and well read. And, yeah. you know, it the show is autobiographical for them too. So it's easy for them to go, I absolutely know what I'm talking about because this shit happened to me. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of hard for people in whatever community, I won't name names, to not accept them as human beings. They laugh at their show, they like them, they're likable guys, and then they talk to them and they go, oh, you're a human being, so I need to change what I'm thinking. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Are you guys, it's your theater company that does mm -hmm. that? Are you working on new things as well? Uh, my wife just wrote a show based on It Gets Better for the It Gets Better project. Oh, is that uh, a musical? It is with the Gay Men's Chorus Los Angeles. Uh, and she's in Hawaii right now doing a show. Boo wow. hoo. <laughs> I'm in Los Angeles. <laughs> I picked the wrong production to tour with. So, yeah, we, have, we did a show called Armenia Mania uh, about the idea of being second generation in a country, uh, which we hope to restage, but our main writer actress in that is Conan O'Brien's assistant. So she got very, very, very busy. Uh, yeah. We see her all the time, and we're trying to put that back together. Cool. Well, that's awesome. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, my pleasure. I'm glad we could talk about theater here on <laughs> Book Circle Book Online. Circle. We cover all the arts. <laughs> um, thank you guys for watching. We'll see you next week. Until then, you can find all of our information on our website, bookcircleonline.com, on Twitter, Instagram, iTunes, and, of course, YouTube. I'll see you later. Thanks. From managing editor Jason Squamata, executive producers Maria Menunos, Phil Svitek, and Kevin Undergaro, we would like to thank you for tuning in to Book Circle Online. For more discussion, go to bookcircleonline.com. And if you have comments, questions, or book title suggestions, write us at info at bookcircleonline.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this is Book Circle Online. BCO, join the circle. Exactly. I guess that's a different discussion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Imperial, this is a reissue.
Right. It is. Uh, but in the world of new comics, it's a reissue that comes out like five minutes after the... Right. You know. Did you initially imagine it as like a graphic novel altogether? Yeah, I don't do uh, what what is somewhat derogatorily called a floppy these days in yeah. comics. Uh, single issues. Not my thing much anymore. I, I tend to think in complete thoughts and I don't do ongoing anything so okay. I when I thought of Imperial I really thought of the ending right away I was like here's what I have to say about this yeah uh, and I structured it as a book uh, but Image Comics is doing very well with standalone issues and the publisher Eric Stevenson just said is there any way to break it up and it was tough actually I had to do a very weird comic format which is front cover 30 solid pages of comic back cover with the credits on the back cover. Yeah. Uh, it was the only way I could think to break it up. So I, I did intend it as just a standalone single volume. Oh, wow, wow, wow. It, it was funny. I, I My new favorite comeback is um, I, I've seen the rings in Saturn with my own eyes. <laughs> <laughs> All these every year. It's the debate between s'mores and the rings of Saturn, and which one is more more ass kicking than the other. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that reminded me like of like Elon Musk. Mm. You know, like he's like he's literally changing the world. Yeah. He's working on SpaceX, which mission is to make space travel less expensive yep. to colonize Mars, and he his like marriages are failing. Um, Electric cars. Yeah, but he's literally changing the world. Yeah. Like that's Mark's debate. Oh yeah. Which is interesting. Very, very amazing. He's yeah, a, he's an incredible guy. I, I did want to play a little bit with that, but but as you know from having read Imperial, I favor the non-Elon Musk's of the world. It'll be two robots talking about books. <laughs> yeah, a way a lot easier for written me. Written by robots, <laughs> which won't have typos. Yeah, is is the comic and like graphic novel industry changing since, like the last like the ten most successful movies ever? Half of them are comic book movies. Is that like influencing the comic industry at all? It, it is, but I'm going to dodge your question a little bit and just say that this is not even a question we have for novels where we go, here's a sci-fi novel and a children's novel and a YA novel and a historical oh. novel. We don't have this question with films. We say, here's an animated film. Here's a live action film. Here's a period piece. Here's a black and white. Yeah. Like we understand that mediums can support different types of stories and can always evolve. Yeah. So comics can do that too. Comics is just another way to deliver a story and you can do any kind of story you want. So yes is the answer. Yeah. But it's unfortunate because comics can do more than just replicate what people are liking right now. And they always have really. Yeah. I guess I'm just curious since like, like uh, print media is like you know phasing out um i just wondered like how that was like influencing well it. i will say that digital comics uh eight years ago people were like oh it's the death of print there won't be printed comics anymore yeah. and here comes the end but just like vinyl records there are people who want to hold that object in their hands yeah. and there are people who want a million different things on an ipad while they're on a train and it turns out that for comics at least those are different audiences the people who would like an iPad full of comics on the train really weren't buying print comics because they're on a train. And so it kind of opened doors to new new readers. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, and we didn't lose the print readers, actually. Okay, well, I mean, I myself don't read anything on, like, a Kindle or a reader yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm old school, too. I like a big stack of yeah. crazy books to fall on me in an earthquake. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Old. Right. Uh, the people who are just trying to make small personal connections. So it, it is. it's a book about... You know, is, is real power the ability to connect with a person or is real power the ability to smash a boulder with, you know, laser beam eyes? Yeah. And it seems like in that debate, though, it's only one or the other. Like, you can never have both. You can have both. Uh, I don't love superhero comics. I'll just, I'll out oh, myself really? right I don't. I've never been good at them. I wrote a book called It's a Bird, which is about how much I don't like Superman. Right. Uh, and then after that, I wrote the Superman comic book. And I really should have just read my own book about how much I don't like Superman and taken my advice and not done it. Uh, probably, but uh, I, I feel like as a kid who was skinny and kind of not tremendously picked on, but not, I, I wasn't going to get in any playground fights and win for sure, that the superhero for me was always this unattainable goal. And I, it really alienated me. I didn't even like comic books, actually, as a kid. My best oh, really? friend loved them, and I started reading them because I had to walk with him to Safeway every week while he bought Spider-Man. And I'd be like, ah, oh, it's so boring. And so I just started buying the other comics he didn't buy and reading yeah. them. Yeah. But I really, I, I liked the outsiders. I didn't like the heroes. I didn't like the muscles. I liked the weirdos. Uh, and so some of my superhero work now, I'm just working out my childhood issues of, of that I like people more than I like crazy superheroes. Oh, interesting. Well, that's interesting because like of the Imperial, he has like the most like standard like superhero powers. Mm -hmm. 
you know, like strength and just flight. Just a super, super man in quotes amalgam. Yeah. Kind of stand in. How did you come to give him like that? The crown is like the source of his power. Well, the the hitch of that book is that Mark, who's the kind of every man, is getting married in mm -hmm. about ten days. At the same point, he's picked by Imperial to become the next stack. Oh. And so I just thought, wouldn't it be funny if instead of like a kick-ass Canadian team, it was kind of a pop culture influenced Japanese team who doesn't come to steal somebody back, but somebody goes back to them and they're like, we've moved on. Yeah. So we just inverted it and, you know, made up a whole new crew and that totally. was Big Hero 6. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering like how f that was in 1998. How did Disney come to pick it as their first like Marvel adaptation? I think a, a couple of things were in its favor. Not and, to be like a pejorative. No, no, no. Well, listen, it, they weren't the most oh. well-known team, yeah. uh, to be sure, and now they're slightly higher profile. Uh, one thing had to do with Marvel's properties all being taken. So a lot of the well-known characters were spoken for, okay. had movie deals, were tied up in other contracts. A lot of like the, the X-Men characters are still controlled by the people who control the X-Men license. So... Big Hero 6 was one of those teams that was outside of everything. It was its own beast. Yeah. And it was available. And because there hadn't been that much done with it, they were forgotten. So nobody had thought of them. Uh, so that was in its favor. But more importantly, I think, was the, the kind of dynamics of that team. And our version, Hero, who's kind of the, the young teenage protagonist, builds a robot to take the place of his dead father. And so it was always about this kind of idea of technology taking the place of your family and can you move on with a placeholder in, instead of the actual person. Yeah. In the movie it's his brother instead. But that had a certain emotional weight to it that a lot of characters when you look at don't. And I know for John Lasseter who runs both Pixar and Disney that was really central to him was that idea of loss of family and can you move on and can a surrogate take the place of the real thing? And so those themes really worked for them. That's very current too with the robots like oh, having yeah, it's that getting role. more current. Soon there won't be us. From the library of Maria Menounos, this is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. Hey guys, welcome back to Book Circle Online. I'm your host, Jeffrey Masters, and I'm here today with Stephen T. Siegel. Stephen's a member of the Man of Action writing team and a creator of Big Hero 6. His new graphic novel is called Imperial. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for having me. Of course, yeah. I enjoyed the graphic novel. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I want to get to Imperial, but while we're speaking about Big Hero 6, uh, that must have been pretty incredible to see it win the Academy Award. Oh, it was uh, amazing. You know, those are... A team and characters that I made up with the artist Duncan Rulo, who's another one of our partners in Man of Action, uh, for a Marvel comic called Alpha Flight back in the 90s. Yeah. And Duncan and I literally sat in his uh, office, which is a little shack behind his house, uh, just working on a thought, how do we have fun this month? What do we do? And I just said, why don't we make up a team of crazy superheroes from Japan? Marvel will probably say we can't do it. And, you know, uh, they didn't. And we did it. And we thought, well, that's that. You'll never see them again. They were fun. We loved them. So it was Oscar. not its own. <laughs> it, yeah, it wasn't its own comic even. It was just part of one. We worked on a comic book called Alpha Flight, oh. which was the Canadian version of the X-Men. Okay. <laughs> and in the X-Men, back in the day when I was a, a young, avid fan, uh, one issue, what, like number 120 or something, suddenly the, the Canadian X-Men showed up and tried to get Wolverine 